Well, I pick a date, any date after February 5th, 1980. And Jill Price can instantly tell you what day of the week it was, what she did that day, and any major event that took place. For most of us, our problem is remembering. For Jill Price, her problem is forgetting. She has a condition called hyperthymestic syndrome, which is automatic autobiographical recall of every day of her life from the age of 14 on. Now, for the average person, uh, having a photographic memory or an autobiographical memory is highly selective. And for us, we tend to remember big emotional experiences like our first game or the first time dad took us fishing or our first kiss or the first time we drove a car, something uh, that, that is tied to an emotional experience. Unfortunately, we also tend to remember highly embarrassing moments, right? Not just the good moments. We also remember, oh boy, the first time this happened, the first time that happened, falling in the mud in front of the friends at school, uh, wanting to do this and tripping and falling flat on my face, doing all sorts of things. Um, I could, uh, we could, we'd have to meet in the afternoon and come back to hear all the silly things that I have ever done that I can remember. And I'm sure I've done many more stupid, silly things that thankfully I've forgotten because if you get to have so many of them, they, they eventually crowd out too. But studies suggest that just 3% of life events are memorable. 3%. That means that of this entire year, 2024, there's only going to be about 17 days that you remember. Mercy is right. 17 3%. The other 97% of your life doesn't make the cut. Most of life fades to black. The black hole called the subconscious. But that is not true for Jill. Jill remembers everything. She remembers that the final episode of MASH aired on February 28, 1983. She remembers that that day was a Monday. She also remembers that it was a rainy day and her windshield wipers needed repairing. Now that might seem like a gift. And it is if you're trying to remember names or, or birthdays or you happen to be a contestant on Jeopardy. But there is a downside, a dark side. In her memoir that she wrote, titled The Woman Who Can't Forget, Jill says this, imagine being able to remember every fight you ever had with a friend, every time someone let you down, all the stupid mistakes you've ever made, all the meanest and most harmful things you've ever said to people and those things that they've said to you. Then imagine not being able to push them out of your mind no matter what you tried. And for Jill, with this condition, the emotions aren't dialed down by time. I have somewhat forgotten the embarrassment of falling on my bike in front of the trolley full of people when I was 14 years old. I don't even remember who those people were. But for Jill... Every emotionally traumatic experience is as fresh as if it just occurred. And she says, as I grew up and more and more memories were stored in my brain, more and more of them flashed through my mind in this endless barrage, and I became a prisoner to my memory. A prisoner to my memory. You know, as I thought about that, I thought, well, you know, most of us, Consciously or subconsciously, we could probably agree with Jill. Most of us aren't alone in that. Most of us are prisoners of our past too. Even if we've confessed our sin, we still feel condemned. And that feeling of condemnation undermines the fact that God is for us. God is on our side. We keep beating ourselves up. We keep sabotaging ourselves. We keep believing the self-defeating lies that come from the enemy and become self-fulfilling prophecies. The only way out, the only exit is fully accepting, understanding, and believing the life-changing truth that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. 
Not a zip, zilch, zero. Not a whiff, not a hint. And that's just the first note in this symphony that is Romans number eight. You know, I believe that consciously or subconsciously, most people, most of us, are held hostages by one or two or three mistakes in our past. You know which ones I'm talking about. Each and every one of you can recall that one, two, or three memories that, oh, if only, if only I would have done that differently. If only I hadn't said that, done that, saw that. And if it's a secret sin, if it's one that no one else knows about, it feels like solitary confinement. We can't get on with our lives because we're stuck in the past. Instead of living in the here and now, we're living back then and back there. We define ourselves by what we've done wrong instead of defining ourselves by what Christ has done right. That's the good thing about being a Christian is I'm not just a follower of Christ, I'm saved by Christ. Being a Christian entitles me to heaven not because of what I've done but because of what Christ has done. If I start to look at myself, uh, if I start to define myself by, by what I've done or what I've accomplished, well that's a surefire road to depression because it's never enough. We're never where we want to be in 1850, Nathaniel Hawthorne, he, he published his magnum opus, The Scarlet Letter. And in this novel, the young lady, the main character, Hester Prine, is, she's found guilty of adultery. And so as her punishment requires, she has to wear a scarlet letter A on her dress, a symbol of her shame, so that everywhere she went, people would know, there goes that adulteress. We think that's barbaric. We think, how could they do that? And yet we do the same thing. We're quick to label people by some categorical mistake that they've made or one dimension of their identity. And unfortunately, that's just as true of our church as it is for our culture. Whether it's an A for adultery, a D for divorce, or a G for gay, that isn't how God sees us and labels us. My Bible says that he takes off our grave clothes of sin and clothes us with garments of salvation. Garments of his righteousness. He gives us a new name, a new identity, a new destiny. He puts a different A on us. We are the apple of his eye. There's a storyline in John's gospel that's not unlike Hawthorne's scarlet letter. A woman is caught in the act of adultery. You are familiar with this story. I've preached on it a couple times already before, but the religious mob is ready to stone her to death when Jesus steps up and steps in. And Jesus, he doesn't defend her adultery, but he does defend the adulteress. And his defense is pure brilliance. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. One by one they drop their stones and walk away until it's just Jesus and this woman. And then Jesus labels her F for forgiven and says, go and sin no more. And you know, sometimes I wonder, I wonder what I have come to this woman's defense or would I have picked up a stone? You know, I honestly don't know. But I do know this. Whenever I hear about some high profile failure, I try to never respond in a holier than thou fashion. The first thing that comes to mind is John Bradford's famous adage, but for the grace of God, there go I. I read a quote that I feel fits here. It says, love people when they least expect it and least deserve it. That's how you change someone's life forever. 
When the Pharisees were writing people off, Jesus was writing them in. When everyone else was was showing them the door, Jesus was showing them grace. The woman walks away, but not before Jesus totally changes her trajectory. Grace is the catalyst that turns guilt into gratitude. One act of grace can turn the worst moment into the defining moment of someone's life. And friends, we have the power. We can be those agents of grace. This was the moment for that woman. It turns her greatest, if only regret, into a what-if possibility. Go and sin no more. You know, God got Israel out of Egypt in one day, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And it happened at a place called Gilgal, 380-so miles northeast of Egypt. You see, the problem was the Israelites, although they were free, they, they still thought like slaves. They still acted like slaves. After all, it's tough to break the cycle that has been happening for 400 years. Technically, the Israelites were set free at the Exodus. But practically, it took 40 years to fully ex- exercise their demons. And it wasn't until they reached that place, until they reached Gilgal, that they finally left the past in Egypt, and God said, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. Sometimes, it takes 40 long years to bring to closure those feelings of condemnation. Sometimes you have to travel 381 miles just to get the past out of your present. But no matter how long it's been, no matter how far you've come, God can still roll away those regrets. It's never too late to be who you might have been. We'll get to what if, but every path to the promised land has to go through Gilgal. You know, if you are in Christ, The Bible says that you are no longer defined by what you've done wrong. You are defined by what Christ has done right. You are a new creation. But sometimes it it takes some time for your new nature to become second nature. Would you agree with that? It takes some time. God can deliver you in one day, but, but it may take years to break old habits or to build new habits. And for the record, the key to the one is the other. If you want to break the sin habit, you'd better establish a prayer habit. Jesus came to put the past in its place, the past, and we need to leave it there. And if you want to leave the past in the past where it belongs, it helps if you bury it, burn it, flush it, or delete it. Isn't that what Christ has done with our sin? He crucified our sin by nailing it to the cross. Don't resurrect it. Every word in the first verse of chapter 8 is significant, but the word that may be the most overlooked is the word now. There is now no condemnation. Full forgiveness is our present tense reality, right here, right now. We don't have to wait for it. How many times must Paul, who was once known as Saul, how many times must he have had flashbacks, sinful flashbacks to to Stephen's stoning or the countless other Christians that he hunted down like animals? Paul was an eyewitness, which means that those snapshots were seared into his cerebral cortex. When he closed his eyes, those images could have haunted him the rest of his life. By today's standards, Saul was a terrorist. But then he had an encounter with Christ that blinded him. He regained his physical sight after three days, but the grace of God enabled him to turn a blind eye to sin forever. And if God, it it leads us to the question, if God turns a blind eye to confessed sin, Shouldn't we? That doesn't mean that we deny our sin or ignore it. If you underestimate your sinfulness, then you depreciate the grace of God. 
Paul himself, he called himself the chief of sinners. He freely admitted it. Huh, he was the worst of sinners. And, and perhaps that's why he appreciated the grace of God most. The reason many of us label ourselves or others by their sin is because it makes us feel so much better about ourselves. I don't know about you, but at least I don't do that. I may be a this, but at least I'm not a that. Makes me feel real good. When I look at Jesus, I don't feel so good. But when I look at other people, I start to wonder why, if I really even need a Savior. And that's the problem. Paul is explicit here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no gradation, there is no hierarchy. We're either in sin or in Christ. We're either guilty or forgiven. We're either sinners or saints. You know, even after his conversion, Paul, he could have let those sinful memories to hold him hostage. Residual feelings of condemnation could have kept him from going on his missionary journeys, kept, kept him from preaching the gospel, kept him from writing half of the New Testament. But Paul knew that his sin was nailed to the cross. And the hammer of God's mercy has no claw. Before you step into that what if, you have to get past that if only. And the crossroad there is the cross of Christ. It's the cross that turns those regrets into possibilities. At Calvary's cross, Jesus broke the chains. He, he broke the curse. He broke the code. And it's history's greatest accomplishment. But sometimes we shortchange it. My sin debt is paid in full, and I am fully forgiven. But that's only half the gospel. That's the glass half empty gospel. We tend to focus on the penalty being paid, which is wonderful beyond words, don't get me wrong. But we forget sometimes that the righteousness of Christ has been credited to our account. So the glass isn't half empty, it's full of the righteousness of Christ. The half-empty mindset causes us to focus on the forgiveness, but Jesus didn't die on the cross simply to forgive you. His aim is much higher than that. He died to change you. And he didn't die on the cross just to keep you safe. He died to make you dangerous. He died to make you a threat to the enemy. He died so that you could make a difference for all eternity. Let me change metaphors for a second. Some of you folks I know, you pray for us, but we like sports, all right? So I, I enjoy watching sports from time to time, and I, I really like watching uh, the Sports Center Top Ten because it just, all the stuff, all the 17 hours of sports I can watch in six minutes, <laughs> this is all the good stuff, right? And sometimes they'll, they'll do top 10 plays uh, of sports, but sometimes they'll do certain athletes. Like maybe they're retiring or maybe they're getting inducted into the Hall of Fame and says all the 10 uh, highlights of, of Wayne Gretzky's career or, or Michael Jordan or, or Kobe Bryant or any of these famous people, right? And, and if you watched those highlight reels, if you watched those top 10 highlights, you would quickly come to the conclusion, these are the greatest athletes alive. They must never miss. It's incredible. You must think that, boy, these golfers, they always hit their drives straight. They always sink these 80-foot putts. No one can tackle that guy on the football field, apparently, because no one apparently ever does. Those highlight reel tapes, they make those players look a whole lot better than they actually are, don't they? But isn't that exactly what the Heavenly Father does with our game tape. All the turnovers are deleted. Every missed shot is edited out. It doesn't show up on the video. It doesn't show up on the box score. Why? Because it's been edited out by the author and finisher of our faith. 
When you're confessing, God is editing. And it's not just our sin that's edited out. It's his righteousness that's edited in. And what's left is a human highlight reel that would make any sports center top ten proud. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we get to attribute your top ten to us. We get to attribute your accomplishments to our worthlessness. And Lord, because you have made us the apple of your eye, we have gone from being worthless to being priceless. Forgiven, but not just forgiven, empowered and changed to live for you. Lord, we love you. We sincerely desire to order our lives after your will. And so lead us, Lord. Change our hearts to be more like yours and help us to grow closer to you each and every day. In your name we pray, amen.